Praise the Lord. We thank the cadet sisters for this rousing rendition. In times like these, we all need a savior, my brothers and my sisters. I want to thank you all and welcome you all for joining us this morning for our Sabbath service here at Cisterns of Living Water. We are grateful that you are led here today for another moment in God's Word with us. And so all of you who are watching us live on YouTube today, we are grateful that you have clicked on the link and you have come to the YouTube channel and you are expecting to be fed by God through me. I want to thank you for your support. We are not live. This is a pre-recorded sermon and uh, I thank you all for taking the time to view it today. I want to let you know a few things as always just to keep you in the loop of what's going on and uh, you know this closes out another week of live programming here. We were with you on Sunday. I was with you on Thursday and as always we are with you this morning. Uh, we are with you though we are elsewhere. We are still with you through this wonderful technology that God has blessed us with that his word continues to be spread. And uh, so I want to let you know that um, tomorrow, Sunday, we will be with you live for another installment of Sunday Night Quench. And uh, so we are looking forward to a, the last Sunday in February, which is tomorrow. We will have the Psalm Hymns and Prayer Sunday. We invite you all to come with your hymns that you desire us to sing. We have some already lined up. We have a couple of Psalms that we will be highlighting through the night. And as always, your prayer requests are always welcome when we present all our petitions before the throne of God. So we are launching another week of programming beginning tomorrow, God willing. Just for advance notice, I will also have an old classic recorded here next week. Uh, I will be again visiting out of state next week, so we will not be live. And so again, we will have another premiere set up next week for you if, uh, if you are inclined to, as you are, uh, sorry, as you are inclined to continue watching at 10 a.m. every week on a Saturday. And so that comprises the announcements uh, as follows, my friends. And so at this moment, just before we enter into the spoken word, we will listen to a song and I want us to listen very carefully to an old favorite Redemption draweth nigh, ponder on the words, they are pertinent to the message and to our understanding of it today.
wonderful, 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 wonderful. To God be the glory. Thank you, Sister Inga Sengis and, uh, and Brother Renoir Sengis for your rousing rendition of Signs of the Times. And uh, may God continue to bless their gift, my brothers and sisters, as they minister through music. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, we now stand before you. I, to present your word, your people who have presented their ears, their hearts, their minds. May I speak with clarity. May the Holy Spirit provide the understanding that your people need of your word. Today, dear Father, may someone be comforted, may someone be empowered, and may someone be inclined to make this the day that they sacrifice the world and come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let everything be done to your name's glory and honor. And we always thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we've been through a journey with the Mortal Kombat series. When I began this, I said we might have to go a few weeks here and so and that we did the lord has led us through nine parts of the mortal Kombat series for anyone who may have missed any part you've missed a lot and i invite you to go to our youtube channel cisterns of living water c-i-s-t-e-r-n-s -E all our past content is there you can watch the mortal Kombat series from part one through nine we detailed the war that began in heaven and descended to earth. We detailed what happened in each part of the universe, whether it's heaven and earth, and we detail what's happening today. We have examined what is happening in the world today, in the church today, in every form of society today. We are living the war that Satan proclaimed on the remnant he has deceived many, and he has a remnant who will not be deceived that he is continuing to war against. But we have claimed victory in Jesus Christ. Until the end of the devil, we desire an end to all what we are living in and facing in this world. The Bible says we are desirous to be absent from this rotting body and present with the Lord. We desire an end to all the strife that we experience on a daily basis. Yes, we are experiencing victory in Christ. Yes, we are growing from the troubles and tribulations that we face because our faith is being increased. We are looking, however, for a day when all this will come to an end. If you look at situations where wars have occurred in our society, the, the post-war is always an issue. You are dealing with the psychological stress that has happened in the human beings who have experienced the war, the psychological stress of the soldier. You are dealing with the problems that arise when families lose soldiers who were once part of the family. They are dealing with grief. You're also dealing with the soldier who comes home but is not himself, broken because of the war that he faced. You are dealing with the reverberating hatred that exists between the two nations that were just at war and prospective retaliation that will come later on down the road. You are dealing with economic recovery because it's big business to go into war. We are the ones paying for the war, but we are reaping no benefits when a chosen few are reaping the benefits of war. That will come in a study. Don't worry, I will detail that for you. You are dealing with a lot of brokenness, broken societies. And ultimately, brothers and sisters, when one war has been fought and it has come to an end, statistics show that 40% of post-war countries revert back to war within a decade. Was it not just yesterday 
or a few years ago, we were involved in a war in the Middle East, then in Afghanistan, and now we are watching the bombs drop from Russia to Ukraine. And America is a huge part of that as well. We cannot escape the fact that even post-war, we are looking for a time when another war will show its ugly head in the world. The truth is, as human beings who live in this world, we have all grown accustomed to never-ending conflict. We have read about the pandemics of the past and diseases that ravaged the world and took the lives of thousands, if not millions. And we have, for the last three years, lived in one, experienced one, lost loved ones because of one. Some of us touched by its effects and afflicted, survived it. But we don't know, but, but our bodies were ravaged by it. Some still experiencing it right now. We look at the times where pandemics has ravaged the world and nations. They too experience economic stress. Now living it, we have realized the effects of it in the lives of men and women. It has thrown the lives of many and all of us in upheaval. You just have to drive to the gas stations now and see the price of gas. Go to the supermarket now and try to do groceries and realize how much inflation has taken effect in our economy. We enjoyed the checks in the United States that the government sent to each home, the thousands that, 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 that we twice received in our homes because of the pandemic. That many of us will pay, if not all of us will pay for down the line. All these things are reverberating consequences when it comes to the economy. Though we enjoyed the thousands freely given by the government for a while. Ideally, my friends, though we have enjoyed seeming times of peace, we just don't know when the next shoe will drop. All these things we are sick and tired of. All these things we long to see an end of. My brothers and my sisters, today's message is simply to drive home a very pertinent point when it comes to the messages given by God. Because in order to truly navigate and mentally surpass the weakening world as I call it. The world is designed to weaken. The world is designed to bring a human being in subject to it. Weaken faith, weaken mentally, weaken physically. Everything about us weaken that we are subject to the world itself, to its corruption, brothers and sisters. In order to truly surpass the weakening world, and the weakening effects of the world, we must embrace the prophesied time of war no more. In order to embrace it, faith is required. And in order to survive this world, we must embrace what faith requires, the time that is prophesied of war no more. If we put our faith in the fact that the government will win another war, we will find ourselves in another one down the road. If we put our faith in the fact that our governments can save us from pandemics, we will be in another pandemic down the line. We must truly embrace the time prophesied by God of war no more for us to really face what is happening in this world and survive it without being depressed and suicidal and faithless. Without it, we are just wandering about in this world professing things, not really experiencing victory as Christ ordained it. You see, when Christ came to this earth, he experienced earth. He experienced all the things that he needed to experience on this earth. He did what needed to be done on this earth, but his mind was never centered on earth. 
His mind was centered where he left his father. He knew he was going back. He claimed the fact that he was going back and that led him to a life of faith in accomplishing his mission of salvation. So like Christ, who set the example for us, like every faithful believer before us, we must believe in it, the promise. We must hope for the promise and we must savor the future reality of the promise. Go with me to Luke 21, 28. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. I want to take my time and drive the point home today because I want when you have left listening to me today, you will claim this thing if you have not already. If you have and you are walking in it, living in it, believing in it, hoping in it, then continue. But someone today is experiencing the world and them feel and, and, and being maligned, being persecuted, being jobless, being sick. They are this close to giving up. And I want to cement in their minds today that now is not the time to give up. Now is the time to dig in your heels and believe what you have been promised. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. The Bible says, opposed to the unbeliever, opposed to the worldly person, who has not come into experience with God. Opposed to all of this, the Bible says, when you are assessing the world, when you are seeing what is happening in the world, the Bible says, when these things begin to come to pass, look up. Lift up your heads. When you see bombs dropping, your head is not drooping, you are looking up. When you see pandemics, when you see wars and rumors of wars, when you see strife, when you see calamities, when you see pestilence occurring in this world, the Bible says you are not like other people. Your mind is not the mind of the natural man. You have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, look up. The Bible says before look up, the Bible says men's hearts are failing them because of fear. But the child of God cemented in the word of God and in the truth of God and in Christ is looking up. Lift up your heads. For what you are seeing is the end of all things and your redemption is drawing nigh. Look up look up so if you're going to look up in the end times you must be focused on what is up what is up that i need to look to so that i can look up first corinthians 15 19 first corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19 the bible says If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If hope itself is relegated to the existence that you and I are experiencing right now, we are miserable. Do you know why? Because we are living in the mess. We are living in the corruption. We are living in the affliction. We are living in the inequality. We are living in the pestilence. We are facing two realities in our mortal existence in this world. One is we must all come face to face with our mortality. We have all come face to face with the decaying body that we are living with. How frail it is getting. From the time it was a child to the time we were teenagers to now adults and many seniors 
and looking back and remembering a time where they were young and spry and full of vigor but can hardly place one leg before the other tired just want to go to rest can no longer take care of themselves can no longer control their bodily functions like when they were children face to face with mortality when we attend the funerals that we have attended over the past years when we have seen our loved ones un not breathing just a body laying in a casket someone we once hugged someone we once loved someone we once laughed with cried with someone who may have saved our lives someone who may have given us an encouraging word someone who may have brought us into the faith dead some mother burying a child some father burying a child face to face with mortality the living know that they will die the living are certain that they will die the living know this fact they will die we must also come face to face with the end of all things if we live long enough to see it There are two sets of people. One will die before the coming of Christ and one will live to see the coming of Christ, the end of all things. That is a reality for everybody, whether one accepts it or not. And so while we are living face to face with death and face to face with the end of this world, that's why we must have a perspective of what is to come so that we can lay claim to it and live in this life with hope. It's why God gives to the believer who accepts his word a view of paradise to be claimed as a promise. There are many reasons why the Bible is given. Yes, we offer, in, we offer instruction. Yes, we correct people. Yes, we highlight what is wrong with the world. Yes, we tell you all the things that are in the world that are not of God. We shed light on all the bad things of the world. But the scriptures alone are not relegated to all the bad things of the world. God has given us an understanding of what is wrong with the world. But God has also taken the time to give the believer a glimpse of what is to come so that we can hold on to it in this present time for our hope to continually be cemented in our hearts paradise is described to the believer so that they can have a smile on their face even when the troubles come you know it's like that smile on your face when that brochure is on your table, you're sitting at your table, working hard, nine to five, nine to nine, working hard, sometimes stressed, but that brochure is on your table of that place you have already booked the flight to. It's certain that you are going there, but you are sitting at your desk and you are looking at the place that you're about to take a plane to. And it warms your heart to know that soon and very soon I will be on a plane to my destination called paradise. My vacation time. Where I will not have a supervisor bothering me. Not have workers stressing me. Not have to wake up in the morning. Go to that bus, that packed train, and commute to my job or drive in traffic to my job. Huh? That brochure is on the table and you are checking the days on the calendar to when the time comes, you will say, goodbye everyone, pack your bags, jump on that plane, fly far away from where you once were. 
and experience the joy of what you call paradise. God did the same thing when he, did, when he gave us a description of paradise, brothers and sisters. While you're on vacation, you enjoy the atmosphere, the beach, if that's the place you go. You savor the hotel experience. You savor the food. You savor the sights that once was on a brochure that you claimed. You wish you wouldn't have to return to the grind while you were laying there enjoying the peaceful atmosphere of what you call paradise. You claimed it long before you went there. God did the same thing for us in his word so that we too can claim it before we get there. Live in the peaceful atmosphere of it before we get there. Check the calendar day by day knowing we are one step closer to the coming of the Lord. Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at the brochure. Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at the brochure. John the Revelator told us, and we know he was in vision. He, wouldn't, he didn't just dream this. He didn't just conjure this in his mind. God showed him this, and he wrote this for our hope and our comfort. John said, I saw a new heaven, a new earth. The first heaven, the first earth created world we live in, were passed away. There was no more sea. He says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It was coming down. Look up. It was coming down. Look up. Claim it. I saw it coming down from God out of heaven. It was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband to be given to her husband. We are looking up to what has already been prepared for us. New Jerusalem, the holy city of God. What did I hear? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. He, they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. Not distant from them, with them. And he will be their God. And what shall he do, brothers and sisters? God himself shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no more crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Why? The former things called death, the former things called pain, the former things called sickness, the former things called crying are passed away. You and I have shared so many tears. We wonder, do we have tears left in our eyes? Pain for what we have experienced. Pain for the diagnosis that have come upon us. Pain for the amount of family members that we have put in the grave. Pain sometimes just thinking we are going to die. Pain bothered by the things of this life. Tears upon tears upon tears. Studies show that the human can never ex go through all the tears in their entire lifetime. They may decrease as you get older, but you can never stop crying. From the time a child leaves the womb of the mother, the child cries. Even though tears don't form because they are still not fully developed, the child cries. And we go through life crying and crying and crying. Until one day God says, I will wipe the tears from your eyes. I will obliterate all the things that cause you sorrow. I will erase 
all the things that cause water to form in your eyes. You will never experience another funeral. You will never experience another backache, another headache, another eye ache, another toothache, another stomach ache, another knee and ankle and shoulder ache. You will never stand at the grave of a loved one anymore. You will never be angry anymore at any form of loss. You will never be diagnosed anymore with any form of illness. I, the Lord says, will wipe away these things from your eyes. I qualify to do it because I am God. I once created this world perfect where man had no reason to cry. But he brought the reasons in this world. He brought a cursed earth. He brought the curse on earth, rendering it a cursed earth that you and I are born in. But the Bible says God will wipe the former things causing tears away from this world. The Bible says in verse 5 of John chapter 21, He that sat upon the throne, God himself said, I make all things new. And he said, write these things, John, for these words are true and faithful. John didn't conjure up these words. The Bible says, God said, John, write them. Peter said, prophecy did not come from man. Men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. These words are true and faithful, not because John wrote them, but because God said it into the consciousness of John and he wrote it as it was said to him and shown him. Do you know what God said in verse 6? It is done. It is done. You know you can claim it now because it is done. When that ticket is bought and the, the, the hotel is booked and your itinerary is set, it is done. You're going, that's all there is to it. The Bible says I am Alpha, I am Omega. Do you know that I am the beginning? So I will be the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. It is done. It is set for you. The only event left to happen is it's coming down from heaven. You will be in it. When Christ would have come and reaped you from the earth and taken you with him for a thousand years in a blissful atmosphere of heaven, you will come down then in it. He that, come, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. The children of faith are counted as the seed. Today, my brothers and sisters, Today, the children of faith are counted as the seed and they are heirs to this promise. To inherit all things. That's what heirs do. Heirs inherit. So the seed of Abraham, the seed of faith in Christ Jesus. These are the inheritors of this. And these are the sons and daughters of God. These are the sons of God. But guess what? The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the sorcerer, the idolater, and all, not some, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Anybody who is likely to be a rebel and start a rebellion will have their part 
in the lake of fire, not in the new Jerusalem. There will be no room in God's kingdom for another insurrection. There will be no room in God's kingdom for another war in heaven. Everyone in heaven would have made a decision to be there. Everyone else, the fearful, the unbeliever, the abominable who's fashioning that character right now will experience damnation for eternity. That is called, my friends, The Purge. I know there's a movie out called The Purge, and everybody says The Purge references what will happen in the end times when the children of God are persecuted, trying to be purged. God will not allow that foolishness to happen. The purge that, we, the purge that humanity must be focused on is when God comes and purges this entire planet of everything defiling. When you understand that purge, you know how to prepare for it. Not to go by weapons and hide in your home to fight. Make your calling and election sure now. To avoid the purge of you sorcerer, you idolater, you liar, you abomination, you fearful, you unbeliever. To have your part in the lake of fire. Make your calling and election sure now. Repent in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you shall be saved. The Bible says in Revelation 21 and verse 10, He carried me away in the Spirit now to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Remember when Satan took Jesus into a high mountain? What did he show him? He showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of the kingdoms of the world, and he told Jesus to bow down and worship him. But the Bible says John is taken to a great and high mountain. Jesus knows what his inheritance is. He knows what God would give him. A kingdom that would never pass away. So Satan's kingdom is foolishness and temporary and moth and rust inhabit his kingdom. So when he offers it to you today and the celebrity of it and the money of it Tell him that you have a better claim to a better kingdom where you shall be reigning with Christ. The Bible says the great city, the holy Jerusalem. In verse 11, having the glory of God, her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. There was a great wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, we are going to get into the description of the promised city, a description of war no more, where we will dwell eternally with our Lord and our Savior. And the details are important as the details of the vacation that you were taking are important. You need to know where you're going. Do they have the amenities that you like? What does it look like? What are the sites that you can engage in? All these things go to the peaceful atmosphere and enjoyment and unwinding of your vacation. So you need to know the details that appeal to you so that you can know that when you go there, you'll enjoy it. Also, you need to know that the place is real. You need to know that the place is real. So God is giving humanity the details of the place that he has prepared. He says, there's a great wall. There are 12 gates on the east and on the west and on the north 
and on the south are three gates each. These are 12 gates. And so if you look back in the time of the sanctuary and the tabernacle in the wilderness, how Israel camped, you will see the same thing. North, south, east, and west, three tribes of the children of Israel camped, and the sanctuary was in the middle. So you know that God is giving us a preview of what is greater in heaven. So gates represent the encampment of Israel. So you have three gates at each point, north, south, east, and west. The wall itself had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You and I, part of the remnant church of God, are what? Built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles. By their witness in the Gospels and through the Bible, we have the Word of God given through them to us. Remember when Jesus prayed, he said he prayed for them which would believe on the testimony of the apostles. You and I today, who were once preached to, read a book, heard a message, and received the word of God into our hearts, and received now, after receiving the word, we repented in the name of Jesus, we were baptized into the faith, we received the Holy Spirit, and we are now sons and daughters with God as were the apostles. And so the reality of the, the kingdom here says it has 12 foundations, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates. The Bible says the city lieth four square, the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. There are no inequalities in the kingdom that we are going to. There are no greater shares and smaller shares. We are all partakers of the kingdom of God. The Bible says you want the measurements of it. They measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of man that is of the angel. He says, you want the luxury of it? You want to understand how luxurious this thing is? More luxurious than any place on this modern earth that you can go. The Bible says the building of the wall of it was jasper. The city itself was pure gold, man. Like unto clear glass. Listen to me. When you're reading Revelation 21, you need to read this thing with purpose. You need to read this thing while seeing it in your spirit, in the recesses of your mind. When you tell me about Paris and you are taking me around the Eiffel Tower, I am seeing it as the pictures are shown me. You are taking me there with you. God is taking us there with him. God is saying, see this thing, man. I have not seen, I have not heard the things that I have prepared for you, but I am giving you a glimpse right now. I need you to claim it. And it's going to put a smile on your face Monday morning when your supervisor is bothering you. And he's going to wonder why you're smiling. He says, listen, I'm getting a glimpse right now of the city that God has prepared for. What are you talking about? Do you want to know about that city? That city gives me peace in the time of trouble. That city gives me patience when you're working my nerves. The Bible said this thing is pure gold, like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation, Jasper. The second, Sapphire. The third, Chalcedony. The fourth, Emerald. The fifth, Sardonyx. The sixth, Sardius. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth, Topaz. The tenth, a Chrysoprasus. The eleventh, a Jacinth. The twelfth, an Amethyst. Oh, I want to go to heaven so I can know what a Chrysoprasus looks like. 
I know I've seen frail rubies and diamonds and amethyst here on earth, but I haven't seen what heaven has, my brothers and sisters. The 12 gates itself were pearls. Every silver gate was of one pearl. The streets of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. The Bible says, all this to be comforted in the reality of the city while we are living amongst the rubble here on earth. While we are living in the meager apartments and buildings and houses that we have. We can claim the promises of a great city prepared for us, my brothers and sisters. Revelation 21 and verse 22 says, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. What is John looking for? John is looking for a place designated for worship. But heaven is about worship. Heaven is about worship. That's why the Bible says in Revelation, it is time for God's people to understand what true worship is. Let me run to that scripture as the Spirit of God lays it upon my heart, I believe it's Revelation, if I remember correctly. Revelation, Revelation chapter, let's see here. Revelation, is it Revelation 14? Is it Revelation chapter 14? Yes, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 and 7. Revelation 14, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every kindred, to every tongue, to every people. The angel is saying, fear God. The messengers of God are saying now, fear God. Give glory to him. Worship him. The hour of his judgment is come. Worship not just any God of your choice, Worship the God that made the heaven and the earth. The God that made the heaven and the earth is not the piece of wood that is decked in your house. It is not the idols that grace the walls of your church. The God who made the heaven and the earth is right now on his throne. Calling his people, calling you. To come into fellowship with him. Fear God and give glory to his name. That's the call today. Because heaven is about worship. Heaven is about giving glory to God. Heaven is about living in a peaceful atmosphere of war no more. While giving glory to the one who saved us. And called us with a holy calling. While reuniting us with the ones we loved. And with the faithful departed. You are uniting us. We are not just reading about Abraham. But seeing Abraham. Not just reading about Enoch. But seeing him. Tabernacling with him. The Bible says. John is looking for a place for worship. But the Bible says. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Are the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of the Lord did lighten him. No more night, no more day, no more tears, never crying again. But praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen Lamb. Oh, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Bask in its glory, brothers and sisters. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. They lay, they cast their crowns at the feet of the Lamb. Because they realize who's king of kings and who's lord of lords. And the, 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 the glory that they experienced while here on earth was nothing compared 
to the glory of Christ itself. So no one has any problem worshiping God. No one has any problem giving glory to Christ, the Son of God. You cannot go to heaven having problems with Christ. You cannot go to heaven with unbelief in your heart because of your problem with God. These things are reconciled right here, right now, when we reason with God, and though our sins be as scarlet, be made white as snow. You're not going to go to heaven to hold your debate with God. He's willing to reason to you right now. The problem is, it's not that God is unreasonable, it's that human beings are highly unreasonable. So unreasonable, they cannot even hear the voice of God. Heaven itself is about worship. So if you don't like worship now, you will not like the experience of heaven. And it is not the meager and frivolous ceremonies that we have here on this earth that we can equate to worship. These are things that we do sometimes under the guise of worship. True worship is done in spirit and in truth in Christ. Our entire lives are encompassed by it. Not Saturday, not Sunday. Our entire lives are a beacon and an example of worship. We worship God in everything that we do. We worship God when we are driving. We worship God when we are commuting. We worship God when we are working. True worshipers worship God not seasonally, but every time. The Bible says, The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. There is no reason to be afraid of anything. There is no reason to worry about anything. Why will sin never rise again in heaven? Because everyone, by the time Jesus Christ comes to reap the faithful beloved from the earth and from the grave, they would have all made the decision to follow Christ. Their desire amid the harshest of times was to follow Christ, to be faithful and just in allowing God to reside in them. So when Christ comes to reap them from the earth, they would have been cemented in him, concrete, unmovable, unshakable in the faith. So heaven is not a problem. They will obey God in the peaceful atmosphere of heaven. They obeyed God through all the obstacles there on the earth. Their faith was cemented. That's why, brothers and sisters, now is the time that our, we are, the Bible says we work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who worketh in us. Allow him entry into your life to manage your life, to guide you through life. Commit your way unto God. In all your ways acknowledge him so he can direct your path to heaven. Now, We are all making decisions now in our lives to walk in the spirit, claiming the promises that God has made very clear for us can be had. The Bible says they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. They which have lived the life of sanctification. They were justified. They were forgiven. And they were sanctified by the Spirit of the living God. And the Bible says when they would have come into heaven, they would have, be, they would have been obedient to the end. They would have endured. They would have pressed towards the mark. They have lived the high life of Jesus Christ. 
and therefore they are saved and therefore they are not in danger of violating the principles of heaven. The people who are waiting to get to heaven to work things out will be sorely mistaken. This is the life that we have been given. How many years you have lived on this earth is the life that you have been given. And as God is true to his word, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached into all the world as a witness and then the end shall come. So the life that you are living right now, the gospel that you are being preached, that is being preached to you right now, is for you to make a decision now for Christ. I have just detailed heaven, a fraction of heaven. I can go to Revelation 22. I'll be here for another hour. I invite you to read it. But if you have not read this thing measured, if you have not read this thing, knowing that's where you're going, you have not read it. You ought to read this knowing this is where you're going. This is your brochure, brothers and sisters. This is the, the, the glimpse of heaven that God has given to John to give to us so that we can read the brochure and smile. Like we're smiling when we're about to go to Paris and Hawaii and Dubai and St. Lucia and Jamaica and Trinidad and St. Vincent and Haiti and all Grenada and Barbados and Montserrat and all the others that slip my mind right now, no offense, like we smile when we're about to go there. Brothers and sisters, the Lord said in his word in Revelation 22, 12 and 13, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I know everything. You see, the one thing, as I said earlier, the Lord says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you. God knows who he's working in. I can't tell you if God is working in you, you know. You can tell me if God is working in me, even though I'm preaching. I know. More importantly, God knows in whom he is working unto salvation. And God knows who has shut the door of their hearts to him for their destruction. And so it is incumbent upon everyone right now to know where they stand. Brothers and sisters, over the next few weeks in the month beginning in the second week of March, I will go through the sermon series, put it on, bring it on. As much time I have spent in detailing you the mortal combat war that is happening in the world and the little intricacies surrounding it, I will spend an equal amount of time detailing to you your fortification in this life. I have shown you and given you a piece of the brochure that the Lord's laid on my heart to share with you so you can see how wonderful it is a place has been prepared for you. For you, yes, for you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior and desire to be saved. For you who have not, this is the brochure to tell you what you need to do. Accept Jesus Christ. No man, no man, no man claims heaven without Jesus. No ticket can get you there. No amount of works can get you there. Submission to Christ alone. Here's the way. Here's the truth. Here's the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And so today, as you have read a fraction of the brochure, I invite you to read the rest in Revelation chapter 22. For those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ, I invite you to read it with new eyes. Eyes that say, this is the place that you're going. And it will take you through the life that you are living right now. And even when you are approaching the grave, yes, you will miss your friends. Yes, you will miss your family. 
But the one thing, missing them and crying will not add a day to your life once your time and your clock has struck its final tick. But the one thing you have that you can take with you beyond is knowing that you are dying in Christ. Hope beyond this life. You are claiming this promise. You are going to the grave with this promise because you believe that what Christ has said in his word, he shall come with the shout and with the trumpet in the twinkling of the eye, the dead in Christ shall rise. First, those of us who are alive and remain shall, we will catch you in the air. But if you're dead, you will rise first. Oh, what a day and a time and a moment that will be. Will you claim it, brothers and sisters? Will you read the brochure and claim this wonderful place? It will calm you in the rough times that you are living in, knowing that there will be a time where war will truly be no more. There will be no more rumors, no more dissension, no more controversies, no more war. We will live peacefully for eternity. Heavenly Father, all that needed to be said has been said. Today I have shared with your people, dear Lord, what you desire me to share, a glimpse of the heavenly vision given to John for the comfort of those who are on the path of sanctification and for the prompting of those who have not yet accepted Jesus Christ to do so now. Dear Father, the work that is left is that of the Holy Spirit to increase the faith of those who need it, to strengthen those who need it, and to melt the hearts of those who refuse to accept. Let today be the day that they surrender all to Jesus. Dear Lord, I give you praise, glory, and honor for just being a vessel, just allowing myself to be used for you to disseminate your information. I humbly submit myself as well to your teaching, to your leading, and to your sanctifying. I give you praise, glory, and honor for what we have done here today. And I thank you, Lord. And I thank you for blessings past. I thank you for blessings today. And I thank you for this wonderful promise to come. May we lay claim on it and may it give us peace as Jesus says, my peace, my inheritance I give you. I give you thanks and I give you praise for the hearing and answering of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters, I thank you so much for joining us today for this worship service. I pray that you have been comforted today by the word of God and you can live peacefully in the atmosphere of heaven even now for the promise has been given to each and every one of us. Let us listen to a song now by Sister Gloria Bailey as we close out today. He is coming soon. Marinate on these words, my friends, and claim the promise that Jesus Christ is soon to come. For your shares, for your prayers. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath day and a new week to come. We are going to welcome his return. We're going to live for him now and read the promises to come.
you know. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the coming of our Lord. 